Hey there folks, my name's Grey and today on Consultronics we go small screen with an appraisal of one of the early competitors to the all-conquering Nintendo Game Boy. We are looking at the technically impressive for its time handheld, the Atari Lynx. But despite some initial hype, a full colour screen and the Atari name still carrying weight, a combination of hardware and battery issues would condemn the system to failure. But the legacy of any console lies in its software library, so join me in looking at the best, worst, and rarest Atari Lynx games. Then we get the bombs rolling with the rickety old arcade shooter Raiden, which would also wind up on the Jaguar a few years later. But basic as it is, Raiden is no pushover, and this port punches well above its weight. Great game. I can actually remember the Atari produced arcade original of this Road Blasters on the Deep Blue Sea shooter. Ports are released to just about every European computer system, from Commodore 64, Spectrum to Amiga and Atari ST. And while now all but forgotten, the Lynx version is a fun, if little, fiddly handheld shoot 'em up that's definitely worth a crack. If Hydra is currently inching its way upwards as prices for Lynx games go, the 1993 port of the creaky old coin-up Double Dragon has gone into the stratosphere. And I'm not really sure why. Yes, it's a faithful conversion of the beloved beat-em-up, but it's Double Dragon. It's available in every system known to man or beast. Multiplayer was the big gimmick not just for the Lynx but also Game Boy and Game Gear and the first title I remember being marketed with this in mind was F1 influenced racer Checkered Flag. A surprisingly decent little small screen racing game, even if your car is as fragile as Anthony Joshua's chin. Well worth a bash. Ah, Dirty Larry, Renegade Cop. This god-awful walking and shooting sim rightly tops many Lynx collectors' lists of worst games for the system. And while I agree, it's atrocious, there's something about the cheesy story and rather impressive graphics that have always appealed to me. I guess you could call it a guilty pleasure of mine. <laughs> Ported from an obscure Atari 7800 game, Scrap Your Dog has you running around varied levels on your quest to get back your pilfered pooch. Rather simplistic controls ease you into the genuinely enjoyable, if fiddly at first, platform action. One hit kills aside, I really enjoyed the time spent playing this one. Check it out. As 
good as this biplane battle royale simulator is, some of you may already have noticed with the first few games I've looked at, one of the Lynx's and later the Jaguar's biggest hurdles that neither machine could overcome. And that was the lack of quality third party support. Sega compensated for this early on in their history with their arcade output, but by this time the Atari brand had lost its lustre. And rather than focus on the strong sales of its home computers like the well positioned ST, instead trying to compete with every front console, computer, handheld and arcade, spread their talent too thin and hastened the company's demise. With the release of one of the most eagerly awaited sequels in years came the inevitable slew of games for almost every system imaginable. The first Batman game shifted machines like the Commodore Amiga tenfold, and Atari hoped lightning would strike twice, this time giving a much needed boost to the flagging sales of the Lynx, like Sega would try to do with the Mega CD port. Atari even went so far as to give copies of Batman Returns away for free when you bought a Lynx. But news travels fast and the poor controls and unfair difficulty meant the game was not in high demand. Atari had not for the last time snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Of the few third party games ported to the Lynx, you knew that Lemmings would be among them. I think it was a legal requirement that it appear on every games machine ever. Although this port of the Amiga platform puzzler classic holds the distinction of being one of the system's rarer titles. I think it was US exclusive, but other than that, I can't fathom why. Still one of the best games ever devised by man, but not worth 300 nicker. It wasn't just the Camp Crusader making waves at the box office in the early 90s, but also the Francis Ford Coppola directed all-star cast adaption of Bram Stoker's Dracula, which clearly inspired someone within Atari, because their 1991 Dracula the Undead is very, very good. But while this could have been a cult classic on, say, the ST, on handheld, it loses something, and maybe the Castlevania route would have have proved more popular. But with all that being said, if you haven't checked this slow burn point and click style adventure out, do so. It might very well be one of my favourite Lynx games right now. Now, European viewers may remember this one as it was one of the more popular games in its day on the computer scene. Its Lynx port really should have been something special for two reasons. First, it's a unique game with a real style to it. Second, with the increasingly obvious lack of third party support incoming, why didn't Atari tap into the ST and Amiga libraries? The Mega Drive and SNES would, a few years later, to great success. But this is Atari we're talking about, where the only certainties in the early 90s were death, taxes and Atari getting the big decisions very wrong. Blue Lightning, besides being one of the main launch titles to showcase the Lynx's sprite scaling abilities, was developed by Epix, the lads behind the game series, like California Games, Summer Games, World Games and the like, and would be the main studio releasing games for the Lynx, a system they also had a hand in developing early on. Epix would try to be Atlas once again and shoulder the majority of game development on the Jaguar as well, but they'd exhausted themselves by that time. Little talked of today, but with games like Impossible Mission, Driller and this excellent Afterburner style flight sim on their resume, their legacy within the industry is secured. Thought 
Microsoft, upon release as a killer app, even going so far to talk of it as the Lynx's answer to Tetris, and in my opinion, it's not far off, Chip's Challenge is a bare bones but compelling puzzle game that is largely let down by its presentation, but if given a fair crack, will not disappoint. My knowledge of the Ninja Gaiden series begins with the 2004 Xbox release and its weirder and weirder sequels, but this Link's adaption of Ninja Gaiden 3 from the NES is one of the best arcade action games I've played so far on the Lynx. A toning down of the savage difficulty for shit gamers like myself is the only missing ingredient in a superb ninja laden platform experience. After the last few games like Dracula, Chips Challenge and Ninja Gaiden, my gaming hackles are up, but then I loaded this travesty up and my ardour has dropped with an audible thunk. Christ above this is a shit game, and I don't mean port, I mean it was a shit arcade to begin with. One of the first to use digitised sprites, a gimmick sandwiched between the FMV gimmickry of the 90s and laserdisc powered choose the path arcade games like Dragon's Lair of the 80s. For the love of God, do not waste your money on this rubbish. Another game that owes its success to a gimmick, this time the 3D driving effect of the arcade, which turned heads when first released, but most of the home ports like this one here, now only turn stomachs. Avoid. It's a hat trick of shitty games, but this time it's the port that's at fault as Tradewest's multiplayer, multi format, Bigfoot and his muscle machine style arcade racing sim was generally regarded as a fun title. But the Lynx's small screen and the shockingly unresponsive controls hamper what should have been a top title for the system. I'm constantly being told that I'm doing myself a disservice by turning my nose up and not checking out Robotron 2084, a 1982 arcade from when Atari reigned supreme in video games. So what are my thoughts on the Lynx version of an antique coin-op? Well I've been reliably informed that in the 1980s the cocaine was pure, which would go a long way to explaining the trippy nature of many arcades of the era. But overall it's fast no frills fun, as games should be. Another Atari coin-op port, this time the futuristic racer Stunrunner comes to handheld. And for once, I've very little negative to say, except maybe it's too fast at times, giving you little time to react, but overall an excellent title you need in your collection. With a title like Zalor Mercenary, I really didn't know what to expect, but to my delight it's a shoot 'em up, brought to us by Epix unsurprisingly, in an interesting if so paced arcade style shooter that actually feels kind of refreshing after the sensory sizzling speed of Stun Runner.
A few games back I bemoaned the lack of Atari ST ports. Well, it did have this, but who else didn't? It's Shadow of the Beast, the overhyped platformer from British developer Reflections, who'd bring to us the first couple of driver games on PS1 a few years down the line. Shadow of the Beast, sadly, is like the majority of European games of this time. Graphically, very impressive, with great music, but gameplay, an afterthought. Another nomadic game that began as a Mega Drive exclusive before EA said fuck that and threw ports around like confetti. And I wasn't going to include what I thought was a common as muck conversion until I saw what this game trades hands for. I mean, Great Caesar's Ghost. How much? I guess the old saying is true. Fools and their money are soon parted. Fast, fluid, frustrating, but most of all, fun. This conversion of Atari's 1987 arcade hit is a welcome addition to the Lynx's somewhat lacking library. Obviously not the kind of game that could compete with the Sonics and the Marios, but then what could? Great game nonetheless. Fuck me, this game is shit. Going by the admittedly gorgeous box cover alone, I thought it a speedball clone. It's not a speedball clone. It's an American football game. And as I don't have a Scooby-Doo how to play it, I'm just going to assume it's crap and move on. Because I've been waiting to try this one, Rygar. Now my first exposure to the series was the PS2 version, Rygar the Legendary Adventure, which is one of the most underrated games on the platform. This port of the arcade original won't turn many heads with its simple yo-yo platform action. But don't be fooled, it's better than you think, and is a thousand times better than Rygar Battle of Argos on the Wii. I half expected this to be a homebrew game of sorts, as there is a thriving scene for it on the Lynx. But no, this is a 1991 release, and actually a port from the Amiga and ST. The Game Boy also had one apparently, which makes it all the more baffling that I've never heard of it. But it's a Wonder Boy clone, which is no bad thing. What is bad, in fact I'd say it's unforgivable, is the crippling slowness of what feels like a really, really good game if given a chance. Try before you buy is my advice. And for the final game I'm going to be looking at, it had to be one of the Lynx's finest showings. And while the Lynx has an enviable line of quality software in its limited range of 70 odd official releases, Todd's Adventures in Slime World, by Epix of course, is a standout performer. So that's it from me, I hope you enjoyed, and if you have stuck around this long, you must be a true Blue Lynx fan. Well done. Thank God I'm not the only one. So my name's Grey, thank you for watching, more videos coming your way soon. So until the next time, goodbye.